Thank you all for coming. We appreciate it. This is our last series, last lecture in the series. Uh, for those of you that don't know me, my name is Natalie, and I'm the environmental educator here at Salton Stick. And I'm thrilled to introduce a couple of our guest speakers for our final lecture series. So I just want to make a couple notes that the lecture series is generously supported by the Adirondack Council, and we're just so excited to uh, have Bill McKibben and Reverend Monix Yearwood here. So I'm going to just do a brief introduction and then let them take the stage. Uh, for those of you who are not familiar or are, just a brief overview. Bill is known for his environmental activism, science writing, and his commitment to raising awareness and fostering actions toward environmental conservation. His seminal book, published in 1989, The End of Nature, is widely regarded as one of the first books for a general audience about climate change and has inspired people from around the world to join the fight for a sustainable future. Most recently, McKibben launched an organization called The Third Act that encourages people over 60 years old to take action on climate change. McKibben remains a global leader in the environmental movement and continues to support educational initiatives and efforts throughout uh, the Northeast and uh, specifically in Vermont and Adirondack, which is really exciting. Uh, Reverend Yearwood, Jr. is a dynamic leader, a passionate activist, and an influential voice in the realm of social justice and environmental advocacy. With a huge commitment to equality and community engagement, Reverend Yearwood has dedicated his life to addressing pressing issues such as climate change, civil rights, and civic engagement. As the president and CEO of the Hip Hop Caucus, he combines the power of culture with grassroots activists inspiring positive change and fostering inclusivity in the pursuit of a more just and sustainable world. Um, and with that, please raise your hands and invite Bill McKibben and everyone. Well, Natalie, thank you. Natalie, thank you so much. And what a, I've been looking forward to this more than anything I've had to do for a very long time. Um, in part because it's always amazing to get back to Paul Smith's and to get to the Vic and to get to, you know, be wandering around on the trails and see Jack and think about skiing and on and on and on. Um, um, and in part because um, I'm so eager to get to introduce so many friends to Reverend Yearwood, who's really about my closest and longest colleague in all this work. On the other hand, he now, you know, in this company, in this part of the world, is mostly known as River Yearwood's uh, yeah. dad. Uh, River scored uh, at least a goal and assist in the last uh, uh, 18 hours as the Paul Smith's Bobcats manhandled uh, the Eagles of Niagara yes. five to four in overtime and eight to seven uh, yeah. today. Well, uh, <clears throat> well, Niagara is enduring the long bus, long depressing <laughs> bus ride home to Buffalo. Rivers gets to come watch his dad uh, uh, talk. Which could um, be as depressing, maybe. I don't know which bus <laughs> one. Um, but but it's, it's so much fun uh, to get to be here. We thought maybe I'd talk for just a few yeah. minutes about where we stand right now, and then Rev would talk about where we're, you know, some of the work we're doing, and then we'll, and then we'll together talk at least a little bit about this third act stuff that both of us are heavily engaged in, because Rev's on the board. Um, I'll say the other reason that I'm in a good mood, um, despite all the uh, plentiful reasons in the world right now to be in a bad mood, um, it, and I was in a bad mood until yesterday morning um, when Aaron, Mayor, and I and a couple other people uh, got to uh, uh, bushwhack in a few miles in the Moose River Plains uh, to see this new champion uh, biggest white pine in the world. Um, and it was really, it was really special to get to see it and to get to see it in Aaron's company, since he's one of the uh, great towering trees of our conservation <laughs> forest. Um, 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 and, and for me, and I say this as a prelude to everything else I'm going to say, just a reminder that the world is still capable of producing happy surprises as well as the other kind. And it really is remarkable to think that this 
very big tree, 16.4 feet in circumference, uh, 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 has been just happily hiding out back there for two or three, four hundred years, and no one's known about it. Um, so it really is nice, because that's not mostly the kind of surprises that we're getting at the moment from the world. I'll do the hard part here and just bring you up to date a little bit about where we stand on climate change right now. It feels to me like 2023 was the year that I was kind of writing about when I wrote The End of Nature in 1989. That actually this year we've sort of broken through a series of really dangerous and scary physical moments. As of this month, we're about 1.5 degrees Celsius above the pre-industrial temperature of the planet, which was the thing we'd been sort of trying to avoid, that we swore we would avoid, do everything we could in the Paris Climate Accords and things. We're there. 2023 saw a rapid elevation of temperature. Beginning at the beginning of the year, uh, oceanographers were pointing out that the temperature of the ocean, which is where most of the heat that we're trapping goes first, um, um, that the heat of the oceans were really high, like uh, much higher than we've ever seen before. Mm -hmm. And by June and July, that was translating into absurdly high temperatures in the air as well. Since June and July are the, uh, because the Earth's land mass is concentrated in the northern hemisphere, the hottest temperatures in the year come in uh, uh, June and July. And those temperatures were clearly the highest we've ever recorded on this planet. Um, the records in terms of thermometers go back uh, 200 years, but we have an extraordinary, of course, array of scientists, uh, uh, of whom Kurt Steger is a very good representative here, that are good at extending those records back with lake sediments, glacial cores, tree rings. Everybody's, I think, fully convinced that this summer saw the highest temperatures we've seen in at least 125,000 years on this planet, which means that no human society that we would understand as a society has ever lived through yep. the kind of weather, the kind of temperature regime that we're now living through. And it's coming with extraordinary costs. Yep. Um, the, the, you, you know, I could, we could obviously list them at great length, but you've been coming to this series, so you know a lot about them. But let me just say, the very biggest systems on the planet are now, uh, have been not disputed. Um, because we've melted so much ice in the Arctic, the temperature differential between the poles and the equator is no longer as great as it was, which means that the, that's what drives the jet stream, and the jet stream is now stuck in these, it's in these strange, high amplitude, uh, uh, long-lasting patterns that drive both drought and flood, depending on what side you're on, and can and, and because things uh, melt so fast, it's, it's so little sea ice in the Arctic now. Uh, uh, the land masses near it dry out. That's why we had these extraordinary fires across Canada this year. Uh, those fires are the kind of feedback loop that we've been worried about for a very long time. Canada will produce somewhere between two and three times as much carbon from its forest fires this year than it will from everything that everybody in Canada does, all the driving, flying, heating, cooking, cooling, and so on. Um, Meanwhile, because we're putting all that fresh water, melting all that ice and putting all that fresh water into the North Atlantic, the Gulf Stream and the other huge ocean currents are now beginning to uh, flicker too. The, the density differences that drive those huge ocean conveyor belts are slowing down. I, I say this only to say that we're now messing with things at the most fundamental levels. Um, um, and so we shouldn't be surprised to see the kind of results we see. Vermont, you know, took it on the chin this year. Uh, um, and, um, and there's you know, no reason to think it won't be uh, an Adirondacks next year or whatever, and that'll be bad. Um, but it won't be as bad as it is in the parts of the world that are 
too poor to be able to effectively recover. Bolivia, in early in autumn, had the worst rainstorm they've ever had, the kind of rainstorm you can only have on a globally warmed planet where warm air holds more water vapor than cold. So much rain fell that it burst through two big dams, and then that wall of water washed 10,000 people out to sea in an hour where they drank. Um, that's the that's the kind of world that we're living on. And we're still nearer the beginning of this story than the end, which is the really scary part. Unless we get our act together very quickly, that 1.5 is going to become, it's almost certainly going to become two degrees very soon, and it could easily become two and a half, three. But Jim Hansen, our greatest climatologist, warned this year, uh, this week, that it could easily become four degrees Celsius. Um, and any numbers, anything like those, are incompatible with civilizations as we've come to know them. There's just too much violent flux and chaos. If nothing else, uh, you know, the UN estimates that that'll produce between one and three billion climate refugees. Look at the political landscape of the world and ask yourself how well we deal with, you know, even a million refugees at a time, and then multiply it by a few thousand and try to imagine the political whiplash and craziness on our planet. But the final thing I'll say before turning over to Rev is just a reminder that the key thing always to bear in mind about this is that it's not like other political problems that we deal with in that it comes with a sharp time limit. Um, most of our political problems you know, we can come back to over time and make a little progress on, take a step forward, then a step back. We've been talking about national health care in this country as long as I've been alive, and we've made some incremental progress in the right direction, and someday we may get there, and the fact that we delayed all that time won't make it harder in the end. A lot of people have died and gone bankrupt in the meantime, but it won't make it harder to do the right thing eventually. But climate change isn't like that. Once you've melted the Arctic, no one's got a coherent plan for how you freeze it back up again. And our sense of how much time we have is very short. The Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change told us that we needed to cut emissions in half by 2030 to have some hope of staying on anything like the timeline we set out in Paris. 2030 is, by my watch, uh, six years and a month away. Mm -hmm. um, so our work is uh, uh, cut out for us. Um, um, maybe the one other thing I'll say, just before I no, end, ahead. is daunting as that sounds, the other thing to be said about 2023 is there are signs that at least in some parts of the world we're beginning to deploy clean energy at something like the not the pace to be required, but something that's within spitting distance of it. Engineers have dropped the price of power from the sun and wind and the batteries to store them 90% in the last decade. That, along with the rise in temperature, is the most important statistic on the planet. It means that we have some means of actually having some hope of beginning to, beginning to try to catch up to the physics of climate change, but it's going to take building this stuff at a rate that we haven't built anything since at least the start of the Second World War. In a few places around the world, that was happening. By July, even as we were seeing those high temperatures, uh, around the world we were adding about a gigawatt of solar power every day. So about a nuclear power plant's worth of solar power every day. More than half of that was coming in China alone, so the Chinese are doing, taking up more than their share of this duty. But that means that there's at least some starting to be mm. built in appreciable amounts elsewhere, and the Inflation Reduction Act will help with some of that and so on. It does not solve our problem, especially since we're not cutting back on the use of fossil fuel nearly as fast as we're increasing the use of clean energy. I tell it to you mostly so that you don't just give up and stop listening to the rest of this <laughs> talk. There is reason to think that reason could prevail. So, uh, you know. Over to you, brother. Man, I'm not sure if this or the bus to Niagara was more depressing than that. <laughs> <laughs> Quick. 
I'm not sure. <laughs> Getting beat by the Paul Smith's Bobcats <laughs> and then listen to what Bill just said. I'm not sure. We got we to figure out which one is the, the better bus here. But we'll see if I can help that a little bit. Um, we'll see. It's really great to be here. Um, um, I'm so glad that my son River is here. Uh, give it up for River who scored a goal. And if a, give it up for Paul Smith's college winning hockey. Yeah. <laughs> And the whole team. Six, uh, six in a row. Six, six wins game in a row. Streak. I think it's the syrup. I don't know. I've, I've got. <laughs> Professor Steger gave us some that syrup one time, and I think that was it. That got me moving pretty fast, there too. I won't say how it got me moving, but I'll just say it got me moving, though. <laughs> it was that good. I don't know that. So good to see you um, at this conversation. Aaron, my dear brother, is, is here. and. And many of you have seen kind of going back and forth, bringing the kid to school. Um, I actually want to start in a different place than where Bill left it. Then I'm going to bring it current, actually. I, want to, I actually want to start, I want to go back 60 years um, from this moment. Um, I want to actually go back to 1963, when actually we are first discovering the impacts of carbon and the emissions on the atmosphere. Um, and we're beginning to understand what it can do. Um, the scientists in Hawaii are beginning to see the impact and they're beginning to put forth that information. Um, so it's not a new issue. But at that same time, what's important is that, I wanna go 63 because at that time there was a burgeoning civil rights movement, a burgeoning queer rights movement, a burgeoning women's rights movement that was all happening at that same time um, where they were literally fighting for e existence and equality. Um, in many cases, we are now obviously fighting for existence and equality still. And so one of the things there is that I want to go back to that because particularly for this rights movement, I want to start there because it was a very depressing time. Um, Medgar Evers was killed in his driveway in Mississippi. Um, the march on Washington, which many thought either should it continue or would it continue, did. Um, and then at that time, people didn't know what would be the outcome. They had never seen anything like that. And then right after that, even though that was tremendous and I was successful, um, a church was bombed in Alabama, killing four little girls. So I just want to just fast forward that time about what it means to be in a depressing moment and what it still means to push forward. Because, as I kind of started out this conversation, I'm not sure if a, a kid from Bethesda, Maryland, Washington, D.C., playing ice hockey, would feel comfortable back then, as he does now, in an area like Paul Smith's. And me and Bill, black and a white guy, sitting in the stands next to other people, cheering for all kinds of people side by side. I'm not sure if that would have happened without the toll, the strife, literally the giving of, of their lives so that we can actually sit here today. So our goal is actually similar. It is similar that it is then 60 years from now uh, when we look back on this moment in, in 2083, where, where will they sit? So I wanted to start there. Where, where will they sit? Will they have clean air? Will they have clean water? Will the Adirondacks even be around? Um, will, 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 will we have more wars for resources? Will we have beyond the Category 5 hurricanes? Will we have droughts in places we never had droughts? Will we have water in places we never had water? I guess it's what we're looking for. So the conversation now is critical because it isn't one of this examination and analysis. It's one of doing. It's one of putting our hands to the plow and doing everything we can so that future generations won't look back on us and say they did nothing. I can look back on now 1963 and I can be clear that even though there were folks that went to the front of the bus, you know, there were folks who were last hired and first fired, spit on, beaten, harassed, 
sat, sitting at lunch counters, being beaten at lunch counters. I can now sit up here on stage um, in a very comfortable fashion because of that. The question that we must ask ourselves is that 60 years from now, in 2083, will they be able to do the same? So let me start there. So the question really becomes about three things then. It becomes around demonstration, legislation, and communication. Those are the three things that actually get us to where we get to so that with those human beings who are around, many of us won't be around in 2083, um, but they will be around and when they get around, those beautiful human beings, um, then what, what kind of world will they inhabit? That's the thing. And so the first thing there is around demonstration. Um, one of the things that was mentioned, as you hear me give this quick spiel, is first and foremost that I have been demonstrating. Me and Bill have been arrested more <laughs> times than we would like to say, and that is usually because of Bill who drags me. So for my son is wondering why is dad getting arrested all the time? It's this guy right here, River. So he's the one who would call me up and have these great ideas. Hey, we're gonna sit in a bank <laughs> and stop the Chase Bank from working. And even though your dad does have a lot of degrees, I was like, yeah, okay, Bill, let's do it. And so we would be there with the other good folks and, and we would be then carted out. Um, and that would create the Stop the Money uh, uh, pipeline movement. And before that, we would be out there and Bill would call him and say, hey, man, we gotta stop this Keystone. XL pipeline. I'm like, all right, Bill, let's do it. And then there we would be out there getting arrested and be in jail for many days or out there. And, but we don't have a Keystone XL pipeline. So we've had wins. We've also had losses along the way. There is a Dakota Access pipeline, and there's still work on a Mountain Valley pipeline, and there's still work on a Line 3 and a Line 6. And so there's work that we've had wins, we've had losses, and we now also have legislation. So demonstration part, let me go into that, because from that I noticed in my work as an activist that the one thing that was missing in this movement was resources. And so I, what was not mentioned in the volume, which is important for you to understand where I'm coming from, is that a few years ago I started to work on the work of donor advisement and helping philanthropy. And the reason for that was because my organization, which is a, both a climate justice and environmental justice and civil rights and human rights organization, I looked at the numbers and I looked at there was 12 foundations, many more than that, but there was 12, the New York, uh, the New School that they study on 12 foundations who were giving it the climate sector. And they looked at just the advocacy portion of that. And in the advocacy portion of that, they gave out $1.3 billion in one year, these 12 foundations, just to do advocacy. And I was like, well, that's a lot of money. It seems like a lot of money we should be doing quite well. <laughs> um, but when I look closely, the New School study showed that out of that $1.3 billion from these 12 foundations, only 1.3% went to environmental justice, women-led, people of color-led organizations. Which means that 99 something percent was going to predominantly white led, white led, cis male led uh, organizations. And I was from that moment saying, you don't win that way. That's not how you broaden the movement. That isn't how you are successful. Um, your resources show your intent. And so I began to begin and go to advise them. I began to look that up and say, hey, we got to distribute the money more fairly. There's folks who are on the front lines um, of this movement, front line and fence lines, that who are in Georgia, they're in North Carolina, they're in Louisiana, they're in Texas, they're now in East Palestine, Ohio. They're across and they're not getting the resources to do the work. It's going to these big green organizations and it's not going in the pipeline and it's not working. It's simply not working. We're creating organizations from 350 and Hip Hop Caucus and now Third Act, but they're not getting the, they're not getting the resources. They're doing great work. They're doing state leagues and state commissions, but they're not getting the resources. So I kept saying that and they listened. And so finally, um, recently I have been appointed the senior advisor to Mike Bloomberg's foundation, which is exciting. 
And then last year, I was in charge of a portfolio to give out $85 million to stop petrochemicals, which is exciting. And then give that money particularly to frontline and fence line communities. So that was exciting. And I'm, is it, and yeah, no. And I, and I realized, I realized that it's actually harder to give out money than to get money. That's how I say, it's not an easy thing at all. But then this past September, it went further and um, Mr. Bloomberg said, well, we, we need to get more money out in regard to stopping carbon, oil and gas, which we'll get to on LNG here in the CP2 fight. And then, so we are now tasked to give out $500 million over the next three years. Um, so literally, one, uh, complaining does work sometimes to get into these positions. So now, but now we're in a position now to give out some real dollars to frontline and fence line communities. I'm excited about that. And still working with other groups. I mean, they're obviously working with groups like League of Conservation Voters and Sierra Club. Those are important, but changing the dynamic of the conversation and how they work. So I want to start there before I get to demonstration. So demonstration. Demonstration is critical right now in our movement. And so again, we need to fund, my idea is funding the frontline and fence line communities. One of those things I mentioned is around um, liquid natural gas and stopping petrochemicals. And why is that important? Because we are actually beating the fossil fuel industry. And we're beating them because they are having to change their business plan. Now, granted, their business plan means a death sentence for many communities. And it does mean a distance for our way of life, our trees, plants, our animals, everything. And so within that, what is happening, they are losing. But what they're really good about is not just selling fossil fuels, they're really good at building demand. That's really what they're, Exxon and BP and Shell and Chevron are really good at building demand. So when even, and it's really building demand for awful things. That's the, it's the most crazy thing about it. We wish they would just build demand for solar and wind and good stuff, but for some reason it is stuck on things that kill us. I don't know why they're just stuck on that, but they just, they, and they build demand for it like, like no other. So they are, they're transitioning, their business model is transitioning. So they know they can't do it, keep doing fossil fuels, and so they're, they're transitioning to now plastic. Plastic is their next thing. Plastic is their next thing. Plastic is oil and gas. And it is, it, is, it is killing us. We have so much plastic fiber in the atmosphere because of this. We now have plastic in the placenta of babies being born. It is, it is curbing so many different things. Um, and so the one thing about petrochemicals is stopping that um, upstream and making sure we can stop that. But also along with that, they're, they're now shifting it to to, to liquid LNG, liquid electrified gas. And so they're moving that as, at one point in time, they, they literally in this country, we weren't even moving LNG. And now we're like the top exporter of this junk. Um, again, because that's their, they see that for some reason, they're like, well, we're losing on coal, we shut down so many coal plants. They're, they're losing on crude oil. So they're, they're, they're just shifting, because they're, again, it's, you, you take nothing from this conversation. They are good on building demand. That's what they do, and they will just continue to do that. So what we have to do is stop the demand and stop them from being able to do that so easily. And so demonstration is very important. So we should continue. So getting arrested, being in the streets, also being in the suites, are very important for us doing our demonstration. But second part of this is this, demonstration without legislation leads to frustration. And so this, the other part of this is that what we haven't been good on, what they're very good on, is that they're very good at legislation and, and sh shifting policy. Or they're very good at taking a policy that was very strong and making it very weak. So at, at, at the beginning part of the conversation, it would be this is a great policy, have a good impact, would actually be useful for what needs to happen. And they will get in there and then weaken it so that it becomes really nothing. And so what we need to do is make sure that we are very good on the, the, the legislation part of that. Um, and I believe that has happened in some degree. 
with the Inflation Reduction Act. I do believe that has happened with the bipartisan infrastructure law. I think it has happened um, to some degree. Um, you know, the thing with President Biden, and, which is unfortunate, is that if he didn't do such bad things along with good things, um, he would actually be a, he would be, he'd be a clear cut climate champion. But unfortunately, he reminds me of Tom and Bill, the person who, you know, buys flowers for their, their partner, but then on the, and on, on the other hand, he yells at them when they get home. So it's like, well, I would rather you not yell at me if you don't give me flowers. Like, you keep the flowers and just that'd be the way we, <laughs> way we would do this. But he does that. So he, he, unfortunately, in the cabinet has not understood that you, you can't be a climate champion if you are talking about renewables on Monday and Willow on Thursday. You, you can't be a climate champion if you're talking about solar on Tuesday and LNG on, on Friday. That's not how that works. And so th there's a push that we must then push them to understand that. And hopefully with what is happening in Louisiana, um, particularly around the LNG terminals and other parts, we can help them to, to understand that. The third thing, so I mentioned there was demonstration, um, there was legislation. The third thing I think is actually very important for our movement, and that is in communication. So the one thing that we, I've realized in being in this movement now since my, really getting involved since Hurricane Katrina, my, I was really born in Louisiana, and so I was in Washington, D.C. when Katrina hit, but obviously knowing that part of the world very well, um, it was something you never shake when you're watching TV and you're seeing places that are familiar underwater. There's something when you then call up your family and friends, uh, Diane, French Cole, Mama D, as I would call her, um, who was in the seventh ward of New Orleans, and you call her up and she can't talk to you and you're checking on her, but she can't talk to you because she's literally leaving her house to go outside because her neighbors are floating down the street during Hurricane Katrina. And she wants to catch the neighbors so they don't float away and then tie them to a tree. That's the kind of thing that the climate crisis brings. And so that has a daunting impact on you. And so for me, being involved in this work and this process, you realize that the movement we have now is not broad enough to be successful. That the one thing that our movement has done and done really badly is that we have created a siloed, segregated, progressive climate movement. I know that's an oxymoron. I know those things don't, all those things don't quite go together. But we've created that. We've created this movement in which we've put people in positions where they want mountaintop removal over here, or LNG over here, or petrochemicals over here, or different pipeline fights, or you're in different, different locations. You're in the Adirondacks fighting over here, where you're in Detroit fighting over here. And it's the same thing. And what's interesting, the other side is very good at breaking silos. They're very good at making their, e their evil work across the board. For example, um, in the situation with East Palestine, um, the frack gas from the Ohio River Valley was shipped down to Houston um, and turned into vinyl chloride, the, which is a horrible, should be banned, uh, pl form of plastic um, that we should never have at all. Then put on trains, put driven across the country on Norfolk Southern trains, and then put everybody at, at risk, and then finally uh, derailed in East Palestine, Ohio. And at that point in time, they had to implode it. How would all this link together? Then when the, 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 the explosion caused animals and people to have this tremendous, this health risk, asthma, cancer, and emphysema, they then took the stuff that was then imploded from East Palestine and moved it back into black neighborhoods in Detroit and Houston to bury it, where it would be forever causing harm to those communities. 
And they have no problem doing that. You can go further on and say Norfolk Southern, which is based in Georgia, for example, is funding the work um, to stop Cop City, which is a facility that people don't want to be built in Atlanta, Georgia, because they don't want that, they don't want to tear down the force to then build a facility. They would rather, if you're going to do training, do your training, but don't tear down the force to go to training to do that. But the same entity is doing all that. So you have the petrochemical, you have the oil, you have the gas, and they all work together. But when we come together, we then are in silos. Me and Aaron Brockovich went to East Palestine, Ohio. I honestly was never hugged by so many people looking for love. I was told, Rev, it's, it's Republicans, Rev, it's MAGA country. And in, and in fact, where uh, Donald Trump launched his recent campaign, he actually lost it in East Palestine. He was there, he wasn't throwing paper towels around, but he was throwing hats. I don't know what that would do to stop the, 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 the pollution in East Palestine, but he felt this need to throw out hats out to the people. But it was the same kind of this insidious thing that he was playing this politics where uh, white people don't matter, and so I'm gonna go there and just stoke that. So when I went there, I'm like, no, I was there with Aaron Brockovich, and I went there, and but the one thing about that, they didn't know because of our movement, that they were now in the environmental justice community. They thought environmental justice just meant you were black or brown or indigenous, that you couldn't be from Ohio or a white community and be in that aspect. So why is all this said? Why does this mean? So communication is needed in this aspect to broaden, to take and create stories and create things. And I believe that that's the next level and we need to do everything we can to simplify our message around this crisis and do everything that we can to ensure that people really understand what it means to have clean air and clean water. Did you know, for instance, that clean water polls very well for both Democrat and Republican? Go figure, I just was shocked. But unfortunately, for some reason, Clean air doesn't poll. I don't know why clean air, clean air doesn't, clean air doesn't poll well. See I'm worried that this uh, was too close to me. That was too close? You think yeah. so? See, see if that works better. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. So that for some reason, clean air doesn't poll well. I don't know why we don't like clean air, <laughs> but we all like clean water. So let's start there. That's a, that's a, that's a starting point. So I, the, the, the point here, I, I want to make, and I want me and Bill to get this conversation, is this. We are at an inflection point. Between the next six years, that future generations will determine how they live by these next six years. Which means that if you are eight, or you are 80, you are going to need to throw down for this planet like you have never thrown down before. Like, I understand what it means to be bitter. I know what it means to be jaded. I know what it means to be cynical. I understand all that. But this moment requires all of us to rise above that. Clearly, there's a direct connection between war and warming. Clearly, there's a connection between the fact that people and humans are becoming so frustrated with one another. In all parts of this planet, they are also beginning to harm and kill and hurt each other. That will happen when your atmosphere is beginning to crumble. That will happen when your crops no longer grow. That will happen when you have droughts and wildfires. That will happen when it is so hot you are just looking for anything. That happens because we know from Chicago to Cleveland to Dubai to wherever you want on this planet, humans are human. Mm. And we know that when you're raising your family and trying to work, and it is weather that has gone out of control. It creates a dynamic that literally makes us humans 
go crazy. So the climate thing is connected to everything. So this moment we now have to somehow change this. We are at a moment now, a critical moment, where we must do everything we can. Now there will be moments where there will be crazy things that will continue to be good things and bad things. That will happen, but you cannot get bitter or jaded or cynical or depressed or give up because the next generation, the one that you will never see and they will never see you, that generation in 2083 will come along and they will be reminded of these moments, places where people gathered in the Vic, in Paul Smith, New York, where people gathered in Morocco to London. Humans fighting for humanity. And that is this moment we have now. That is, as Bill knows, that says all the time. That is our lunch counter moment for the 21st century. And we cannot fail. We cannot fail. Amen. And the one thing that I know that I have seen is that organized people beats organized money every single time. And this set of humanity cannot start to lose now. The stakes are too high, they're too grand, and too important. And we will have clean air and clean water and forests and trees for the next generation. We must and we will. Thank you. So the, the important stuff is done now, and thanks to Rev, as always, for doing it, because he is the heart and center of an awful lot of this. Let me just, before we do questions and things, just make three brief things about what the story is that we need to be telling, I think, um, what the next direct challenges are that we're taking on in these fights, and importantly, who some of the people are that need to be fighting. Yeah. Um, first, in terms of story, it's an interesting moment. Yep. Human beings, having spent the last 700,000 years setting things on fire, no longer need to do it. We can end combustion on a large scale on this planet very fast. We don't need to burn coal and gas and oil and biomass because we figured out how to take full advantage of that big fire that the good Lord was kind enough to hang 93 million miles up in the sky. We know how to do it, and if we do, we can head off climate change, we can stop nine million people a year who die on this planet, one death in five, from breathing the combustion byproducts of fossil fuel, and we can disempower the, the way too powerful people who end up owning, because they control coal and gas and oil, end up with way more power than they can use uh, wisely. So in our country, the Koch brothers, who are our biggest yep. oil and gas barons, who used their money to degrade our democracy. In Europe, Vladimir Putin, who used his oil winnings to launch a land war in Europe in the 21st century. Uh, you know, on and on and on. We all have sun and wind, and so, it's a beautiful, beautiful possibility. Not perfect, you have to mine lithium, we need to figure out how to do it as well as we can, on and on and on, but no comparison with the scale of the trouble that we're in. Um, second thing, as Rev said, what that story runs into is the extraordinary power of a relatively small subset of human beings and institutions who do not want to make that change. The fossil fuel industry is to be understood best, I think, as the group of people who want to keep burning things. That's right. Because they have 
extraordinary reserves of coal, gas, and oil underground. And if we stop setting them on fire, then those will be valueless instead of being worth the tens of trillions of dollars that they're currently worth. So they're always looking for a new way to set things on fire. Because we're beginning very slowly, not fast enough in this country to cut back a little bit on the amount of stuff that we burn because we're going to electric vehicles and heat pumps and so on and so forth. Their next big plan is to export as much of this stuff that they have lying around as possible. The US is now the biggest exporter of fossil fuel on planet Earth. We've done all of that in the last seven or eight years. And we're set, if they can get away with it, to remarkably increase this, quadruple this, over the next decade. The biggest part of this is this thing that we've been talking about, LNG, liquefied natural gas. What that means is, when they discovered how to frack, they ended up with so much gas in the Marcellus Shale, but especially in the Permian Basin around Texas and mm -hmm. so on, that they have more gas than they have any idea what to do with domestically. So now they've figured out how to put it on ships, super cool it, and send it abroad where they then heat it back up again and pipe it down their pipelines. This is truly dangerous at, the sc at any scale, but at the scale we're doing, it's almost unbelievable. If the US continues to build out this natural gas export thing on the timeline and on the scale that the industry wants, by 2030, American exported natural gas will produce more greenhouse gas emissions, methane and carbon, than all of Europe doing everything that everybody in Europe does. Every house, factory, and car from Greece to Finland will be doing less damage to the climate than the tiny group of companies exporting American natural gas out of the Gulf. It is the biggest single climate bomb on the planet. Mm. And we know as of two weeks ago, thanks to the great scientist, upstate New York scientist Bob Howarth at Cornell, that literally putting this stuff on a ship where it leaks out into the atmosphere makes it way worse in many cases twice as bad as if we were exporting coal, which we've always thought of as the dirtiest stuff on the planet. So this is code red emergency. The good news is, to go to what uh, uh, Rev was saying about Joe Biden is, it allows the opportunity for him to have a huge and substantial win. He's already credibly can say he's done more to build the clean energy side of this equation than any other president with the Inflation Reduction Act. But he's been terrible so far on the stopping the dirty energy side. Earlier this year, much to the dismay of younger voters in particular, he approved this Willow Oil Complex in Alaska. It was a very bad idea in physical terms, but also in political terms. Happily, he can make up for it. The next single project on this liquefied natural gas thing in the Gulf of Mexico, back in Louisiana, in Rev's old country, uh, Cameron Parish, Louisiana. Right. The next one they want to build, it's called CP2, huge gas liquefaction plant, would be associated with 20 times the greenhouse gas emissions of that Willow oil complex over its lifetime. And happily, Biden can stop it. That's right. It's going to take a little bit of pushing, and you may get a letter from Rev and me sometime in the next few weeks saying, we could use you in Washington sometime in maybe January. Um, and it's possible that you, know, you should bring a little bit of bail money with you when you come. <laughs> um, um, because it may take a little bit of that. But I think this is a fight that we can win. Um, in the same way that we won this fight a decade ago around the Keystone That's Pipeline right. that really launched the so, final part of this thing, and, and there'll be other fights too, but this is, this is as big as they get. And if we lose it, if they keep building this stuff out at the rate they're going, then a lot of the other <laughs> stuff we're talking about gets sort of moot. You know, there's, just, there's limits to how much this planet can deal with. Final thing is just this question of who should be 
doing this work. So far, young people have been doing the most of it. When I started 350.org, it was with seven college students at Middlebury. We've now organized 20,000 demonstrations in every country on Earth except North Korea. We've been having, you know, doing, making lots of good trouble. One of the things we did was this huge divestment campaign that's now become the largest anti-corporate campaign in history. We're at about $40 trillion in endowments and portfolios that have divested from fossil fuel. A lot of that was on universities, Harvard, Oxford, Cambridge, University of California, University of Michigan. Young people did that. When they graduated with all that knowledge about how to campaign, they formed the Sunrise Movement that brought us the Green New Deal. And that Green New Deal, once it had been run through the Joe Manchin sausage-making machinery in Congress, became the Inflation Reduction Act. Not so good as it was when it started out, but it is a good reminder that if you absolutely need a trillion dollars, you probably should ask for $30 trillion when you're yes. beginning. You know. Um, um, and of course, around the world, young people the same. I got to write my friend, and I really like her, and really there's no one on the planet except Rev I like working with much more. I got to write Greta Thunberg a letter in June congratulating her on her graduation from high school. Think about that for a minute, okay? Um, um, and there are 10,000 Greta Thunbergs around this planet, and they have 10 million followers. That's how many kids were out on school strike in September of 2019 before the pandemic hit. But Rev and I, I think, have both heard one too many people say, it's up to the next generation to solve this problem, mm -hmm. which is A, ignoble, and B, impractical. For all their energy, intelligence, idealism, young people lack the structural power to make change on the scale that we need in the time that we have by themselves. When, we st when I started casting around a few years ago to thinking about who does have structural power, I began to understand that, well, how to old put people. it. How, old people. Old how people. How to put it, how to put it bluntly, if, if like me, you're beginning to have hair come out your ears, you probably have structural power and coming out your ears too, you know? Um, there are 70 million of us over the age of 60 in this country, and there might be one or two in this room who fit in that category. Um, there's a lot of us. We punch above our weight because we all vote. There's no known way to stop old people from voting. Um, and we ended up with most of the money. We've got 70% of the country's financial assets. So if you want to take on Washington or Wall Street or Albany, it helps to have a few people with hairlines like mine engaged in this battle. And that's why we started Third Act, which Rev is on the board of, um, um, our small but capable board. Um, um, and it's why it's been such good news that it has spread so rapidly. We're about to come up on our second year anniversary and there's now chapters right. in pretty much every state in the country. And in New York, there's uh, also an upstate New York chapter well represented here today. Thank you guys for being here so much. You can get those, you know, pick, you, grab yourself a button on the way out, but sign up so that we can be in touch. This is one of the ways that we're going to get this work done. And the story that we're telling is different from the one that kids have to tell. They have the harder story. If you're 18 right now, you're staring down the barrel of a lifetime on a world that is going to work worse and worse and worse unless we really get our act together fast. We don't have to, I mean, there are days when I read the newspaper and say to my wife, Sue, I am glad I am old, you know, um, um, because... It, I actually never say that. It's, uh, <laughs> the, uh, well, that's good, because I wouldn't want you talking to Sue in the morning, you know, like that. <laughs> but, um, um, but, um, um, uh, but we're thinking at some level about legacy, you know, right. which is a pretty abstract word until you're nearer the exit than the entrance, at which point it... Start, you do start to think about just what Rev was talking about and think about the legacy. Rev and I once went to jail with Julian Bond, who had right. been one yeah. of the great heroes of the 
of those lunch, he organized one of those earliest lunch, lunch counter, counter sit-ins yeah. in 1963 and then went on to be a crucial leader of the civil rights movement. And it was an extraordinary honor to be handcuffed next to him in the paddy wagon, you know. And, and Jim Hansen. And, and Jim Hansen in the same paddy, it was a pretty good paddy wagon um, that we were in. Um, 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 you know, he could I also look, never say that as hmm. well. I also never say pretty good paddy wagon. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> he, could, he could look back on his life, I think, with a sense of really intact legacy, you know? And we want to be able to do the same thing, all of us. We do not want to leave the world a worse place than we found it, but that's where we're headed at the moment, you know? So, end of, I don't know, do you have more to say or should we have questions and no, questions comments and yeah. critique well, and abuse yeah. and whatever? People are up for. Is that okay, Natalie? Yeah, I can pass the Do a little bit of that. You can just shout out or however is good. But just want to say tomorrow, I'm, I'm, I might be leaving, but we mentioned hockey tomorrow. Uh, Paul Smith is at the beautiful Saranac Civic Center. I guess it's brand new, right? Seems to be brand new. So tomorrow at 12, they're playing University of Albany. So be up for hockey tomorrow. I will just tell you that if you, Stop if you go, one of the features of the Saranac Lake <coughs> Civic Center, which makes sense, it's just an ice ring, is it's really cold. So wear your long underwear. Uh, Rev and I were, were big patrons of the hot chocolate stand in between periods. So, you know, but it really is fun, I got to say. So thank you all enormously for yeah, bearing definitely. with us. Definitely. Repeat. So, uh, Rev, so uh, third act, I didn't realize it was only two years old. So where where is it going? Where do you see that organization going? How do we help the organization? Well, sign up and thirdact.org are just outside and people will be in touch. I think it's going to be really important. Um, you know, um, it's not like, the, I mean, one of the things we've come to realize sure. is that when you organize young people, that's great and they do great work, but people don't stay young very long, you know. Uh, pretty soon they're married and having kids and whatever, they're in the part of life where it's hard to do this kind of work. If you organize, if someone gets involved in something and they're, I don't know, 64 or something, well, I mean, it's a pretty good chance you've got another good quarter century of, of important work to do. And the amount of work and the ability to do stuff that people are doing is really extraordinary. We're organizing around climate and democracy because we think yep. they're deeply interlinked. And, and frankly, I mean, for example, you know, if the next presidential election goes badly and we lose four more years, like we lost four years in, you know, uh, uh, in the last decade, we're out of, we're, we're plumb out of years to waste, you know? Um, so uh, uh, that's, that's why we're deeply politically involved as well as doing all this sort of organizing around climate and things. Um, but I think it's going to, I think it's going to be a, a really important um, part of this fight. We cannot have people just deciding that they've, having reached a certain age, that they're, you know, off the hook for uh, 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 working on the, just the opposite. In a rational world, um, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you, I'll just tell you one quick story. Yeah. When I, I wrote the letter, I was thinking about this because I'm getting ready to write this letter about telling people to come to Washington in January. I wrote the letter that asked people to come for the Keystone, beginning of the Keystone fight, to come get arrested in Washington in 2011. Yeah. Um, and, and I said in that letter, I don't think in this case young people should be the cannon fodder for this action because if you're 18, you know, an arrest record might not be the absolute best thing for your resume, you know. One of the unmixed blessings of growing older is past a certain point, what the hell are they going to do to you, you know. Um, 
Um, and so it was with pleasure when we, we didn't ask people, Rev, as they were getting arrested. You remember, we were there those two weeks that this was going on. We didn't say to people, how old are you, as they were getting uh, uh, hauled away, because that would be rude. But we did say, cleverly, I think, um, um, who was president when you were born? And the two biggest cohorts were from the FDR and the Truman administrations, which was great. What was really great was that the young people who were there, I think, got to see their elders acting the way that you need elders acting in a working civilization. I don't mean by that that you have to get arrested, though I'm always impressed by the number of people who tell me that it's on their bucket list and can I help, you know. Um, but I do mean that you have to be outside your comfort zone, engaged, active. If I had to sum up what we were doing at Third Act, it would be we're doing the opposite of my least favorite bumper sticker I've ever seen. And you see it on Winnebago's sometimes or things. And it says, I'm spending my kid's inheritance. You know, ha, ha, ha. Um, I mean, literally, that's what we're doing on the largest sense now in this planet. And what kind of human being would think that that was a clever thing to say, you know? Um, it's the least clever thing that you could possibly come up with. So I'm very hopeful that this third act thing seems to have hit a nerve. It's growing super fast, um, and, and, and it's a lot of fun, in part because people hearken back to their first act, um, which was at that moment, if you're in your 60s or 70s or 80s now, of extraordinary cultural and political and social transformation, you know. Um, and if we did it once, we can do it again. When young people come up and say to me, as they occasionally do, they'll say, you know, okay, boomer or whatever, and I always just smile and, you know, because I get where they're coming from. But I do say, and this is something I think Rev and I have written a little bit about, I do say, yeah. You do have to admit, though, our generation did produce the best music of all time. Oh, yes, um, and, and, and so it's been really fun to have. We've had Carole King and Bette Midler and Neil Young and, you know, uh, 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 on and on. Um, um, the Chambers brothers uh, leaning in on this work. Rev and I wrote a piece once for The Nation where we argued that the most important environmental anthem of all time had, did not come from John Denver yeah. or anybody else, that it was Marvin Gaye in 1971 singing Mercy, Mercy Me, the ecology song, because it was clear right yeah. at that moment that, at least for a little while, everybody in America was engaged in this fight, from the inner city out to Paul Smith's, you know? So that's what we need again. I would just add, just the one thing I think is solidarity. I think that this moment, I think, you know, Again, it's, it's, it's heavy stakes. Um, you know, when you talk about existence, you're talking about literally um, if people on the planet, the planet will be fine, obviously, but people on the planet, will we, you know, have a planet that we can live on? It's heavy stakes for a young person, and I think it's almost, it's hard for them to see older people like us to then be like, well, we've lived 60, 70 years, so we're good. We got the good stuff. We, yeah, we got it, and we actually quite enjoy these, you know, these, these nice warm winters, you know, that, that craziness talk. And so I think for them it's hard when they're 20 and 12, whatever. And I, and I see it a lot around young folks I'm working with um, who now say things like, you know, they don't want to have kids or, you know, they just, they don't want to go out. So I think that seeing multi-generations working together is one important. I think too, for those of us who are older, I think that we, um, we can also, we can provide this wisdom that can be provided in many cases. Um, and I think the thing that's also just really important for me, what I've seen for Third Act in particular, is that I think it's also we have some sins that we didn't deal with that we need to deal with as well. So I think that we, I kind of mentioned this earlier, that we are climate movement was, if you look at it, in 1960, between 1968 and 1972 is when most of the climate organizations are created. So LCV, Earth Justice, Air Force Action Network, I can go online. Then the NRDC. conservation movements are, are older, obviously. NWF and Sierra Club are older, but they have other issues too that they've dealt with. And the, and the from that standpoint, but between 68 and 72 
is actually when most of the organizations are created. And like you look at it, most people who are then in their 50s or organizations are very similar. So I think that we have to also realize that we created institutions that were kind of not as inclusive. And so now we have a little bit of an opportunity now as we get older to get it right. To get it right. Amen. So I do think that Third Act is an opportunity to, to say that, you know, we, were, we weren't listening to what was happening with the American Indian movement aim and what was going on in Standing Rock or in Alcatraz. We weren't listening to the, the black people who are dealing with black power and fighting. We weren't listening to the queer people in New York who were fighting for We weren't listening to many, many issues. We, we heard it, but they weren't, we kept it siloed, I think. But now I think we get it and we're doing better. And so I think that as we now come out, young people can see that because their movement today, they are much more as an intersectional environmentalist in the, at this time than obviously we were. So I think that us showing up in third act in that aspect and then this connecting of democracy and climate is critical. I think that we, we have to connect those dots um, because, as Bill said, either you, either you shape policy or policy shapes you. Mm -hmm. So I think that we're in that moment now. Amen. You know, Bill, I, I was thinking you referred to uh, music. Uh, the civil rights was phenomenal. And I think we need that. We need the uh, arts movement as powerful as it now as it was then. I think of Taylor Swift, look at the millions and millions of people. Where's the story? Or for a lot of different people, you know, Rev, or you're in the, you know. Rev should talk about this. But I do does. think we really need to get uh, the, the, because they're media savvy. The people in the arts are profoundly media savvy. And we need that energy too. Because we need older generations and younger generations really powering together. Rev has done such a great job of energizing the hip hop community, which is 50 years old as of this year, you know, That's right. um, um, and making that an important part of this fight. Yeah, I'll say this. I know we're up on it time wise, but I'll say this. That's an important piece. We I think that we, we you you have to use your cultural expression to shape your political experience. Right. You, you have to use culture and music for different reasons. One, it's important not just for audience building, mentioned Taylor Swift and others. It's also just important for your soul, That's right? Because right? I think sure. that to do this work, regardless of wherever you, you fall, um, either you're theist or atheist or agnostic, if you're pulling on yourself you, that's not sustainable. You have to pull on. You have to have something outside of yourself that you can see. And I know that here it's probably pulling on the beauty of the tree. We just had a couple of concerts with the trees or the river or you take a canoe or the snow. There's, but you have to have something outside that you can be like, this is what I'm fighting for. And music and arts does that. Music hits your spirit in a way where it reminds you. In a way, and artists themselves, I'm sure there's some artists here, or poets or sculpture or even food or whoever, there's different ways of being, being an artist. Artists are unique human beings who are just amazing. We need them in our <laughs> movement. But artists also are like, they can hear and see things sometimes before others can. And so pain and suffering, why right? they're artists so beautiful. Even in this room, we have these on the sides of the walls, these, these, the, the mountainscape. But that's important because artists see things that we can't see. And so sometimes our movement being such a think tank movement limits that kind of thinking, and that's problematic. The other thing I think what you're saying is why it's important is that the difference between the sparks movement is was that you also had Mr. Belafonte and many others, right, who were not just outside the movement, but they were also part, of, they were in the audience. And so Joe Baez and many others, they were in the audience. Even with Marvin Gaye, the reason that's important because they were around other artists mm. who were able to then move them. Our movement has Amen. moved where we kind of want to give artists talking points 
and then say, these are the talking points. <laughs> we have all the answers, and now go do that. And that's not how that works. So I think that there is a shifting there that's happening, and we're seeing it around in other economic justice and racial justice and other issues as well. But that's what I would say to that. I, I do think that people, they always look for art and music to be a part. The, in this, this area, obviously, from Woodstock, obviously, and other parts of New York, and the, the cases, understands this, that, again, our, this is, I hate to say it's the end of the speech, but this is, our movement, for a lot of us as activists, has to learn how to become outcome independent. And we are so focused on ensuring how the game ends. We just came from the hockey game. We had no idea. The game was literally, at one time, it was four to two. Six to four. And then it went to six to four. Yeah, and then one. it ended up eight to six. And if you had left at any point in time, you would have you would have been like, oh my God, I think it was four to two, Paul Smiths. And now it's now it's six to four, Niagara University. Now it's eight to six. And literally, I, I have my hair, but Bill doesn't have his. So so he was Bill was pulling, taking his little skull hat off and his running his hands through his hair. And I was like, but, but Bill, you, you're gonna lose all your hair. You're not gonna have everything left. And he was just running it through. And it was my goodness. And it was had a young me and Bill started yelling at the referee. And we didn't know what, you know, yelling at the referee and all this kind of stuff. But we never knew what the outcome was gonna be. Right? And that kind of made it more fun. Our, our movement. The minute that it, we go down six to four, we want to leave. Mm. We get nervous because we're like, we don't know. And art and music Help. helps you. Amen. So I just want to add that, that we have to be okay in a sustained state, not knowing how this, I know this is terrible, but we don't know comes out how this comes out amen we don't know if we win or lose but we we if we don't have art along the way then we lose twice that's true yeah. very nicely put okay. so how do you plan on awakening those who have drunk the kool-aid from <laughs> <laughs> and effectively defeat the Republican Party. Yeah, I, think I can answer that on my East Palestine trip. So, I mean, I think, I think this is the thing. I think that, I mean, that's a hard one. It's a culture, it, 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 it runs deep. But I, I do think that goes back to the solidarity point. Um, I think you just gotta just state, you gotta, you gotta, you gotta, you gotta, you can't prejudge communities, you gotta go in there. Um, when I went there with Aaron Brockovich to East Palestine, and I'll say this, I mean, it was a fact. I had never been hugged by so many white people, actually, <laughs> in East Palestine, Ohio, wearing MAGA hats, actually. I was like, my God, I'm not sure this is a Find real right hug, place? or yeah. are you actually holding me? I'm not sure what's happening right now. Um, <laughs> um, so, but I think it was one love, right? I mean, today's Veterans Day, I'm a veteran. I was a US Air Force officer. So today, happy Veterans Day to anybody. anybody. Um, and, uh, and I really got a, a lot of love for my country. I really do love my country. Um, and um, obviously, I think Aaron mentioned some others who were here, who were also in the military. I think, you know, when you sign your, and I have my, my kid is here, right? And then I got two of them. But I actually signed my name on the dotted line to die for this country, to die for you, right? I, I did that willingly knowing that River and his brother may not see me again for you to have democracy. And I was with that. I'm, all, I'm still okay with that. I am still cool with that decision. And so um, I think you got to come with that spirit as an American, first and foremost. And you got to listen to people. And people, people, and you got to have solutions. One thing I will say for this generation of young people, is that while they may not seem to be as revolutionary as we were in the 60s and 70s, 
they are very solutionary right now. And I think that they look for it, like you just asked your question, they, you, they want solutions to tough, to tough situations. So for me, I would just say that um, love, um, integrity, and keeping it, as we say in hip hop, keeping it 100 um, in a way in which that people, when you go to them, you're not, it's not usatory. And I think that people in this country feel that way. They're being used. Um, and I think you gotta go to it, and, it, and that takes a long time. That may not be one lesson cycle. And, it, and in some cases, it may not ever work. There may be some people have drunk the Kool-Aid and it's, it's gonna be that yeah. way. But you gotta go in there and really try to work. And I've seen, I've seen that in many places. So I haven't given up hope, let me say that. And I just haven't given up hope. And I think that, again, when I was in East Palestine, I was just there two weeks ago for my seventh time, post the February 3rd disaster. Seven times, which means that I now, from a scientist who told me, you've not, I've now been there enough where the chemicals that were there, I could be impacted as well. So I, that's ultimate solidarity, right? And I pray nothing bad, obviously. But I say that because I still believe in humans. I still believe in humanity. I believe that I wouldn't be sitting next to Bill if I didn't believe that black and white and brown and red, male and female, straight and gay, theists and atheists, humans could fix this crisis. I really believe, and I actually think that is the secret sauce to this whole conversation, is that I actually believe that if humans come together in the most daunting crisis they've ever known, it is actually in humans that can solve this if they come together. Literally, if they figure out how to plug the boat, they win. If they keep fighting, then they all drown. That is this moment. Yeah, the, the, um, that's so <laughs> correct. Uh, I mean, in the short run, we have to fight super hard to make sure that we win the next election and, and so on. And, and, there's no secret, easy way to, you know, turn people around. And I, you know, we're coming up on Thanksgiving. Don't destroy Thanksgiving dinner arguing with your crazy uncle, you know, whatever. But do spend some time with your sweet aunt, you know, who probably is really worried about what the future holds. And try to, 70% of Americans know that climate change is a real problem. We need some large subset of that 70% actually doing something. And then in the larger sense, I think Rev's absolutely right. I mean, there's a way in which you can look at climate change as a, which is by far the biggest thing that humans have ever done or ever will do on our planet. You can look at it as a, it's a test of whether the big brain was a good adaptation or not, okay? Uh, it gets us in a lot of trouble. Can it get us out of a lot of trouble? My guess is that the answer to that has more to do with the size of the heart that that brain is connected to. Mm -hmm. And that's what we're gonna find out. That's why we do things like third act and so on. Um, we'll just find out if there are enough of us who care enough and will work hard together enough across all the barriers that the forces on the other side would like to throw up between people and divide them and so on and so forth. We'll see if we can. And we don't know the answer to this. Um, right now, the planet is running an extraordinary fever. The only antibodies that can come to work to do anything about that are us. We're the antibodies that have to be mobilized by that fever and try to fight off that infection. To use that metaphor, it doesn't always work. Sometimes there aren't enough antibodies. Sometimes the patient dies, you know? And you can make a case that we're, you know, that the physical momentum of the climate system is now at a point where it's gonna be very hard. But we, but the best science indicates that we have, if we work really hard right now, not a way to stop global warming, it's too late for that, hmm. but a way to stop it short of the point where it destroys all the things that Love. all the generations of humans that came before us managed to build and work for on this planet. And if we have that chance, 
then it's somewhat of a burden to have to do it, but mostly it's a real honor and a privilege to get to do it. And if we think about it in those terms, then we'll work hard enough. That's, sure. that's my guess anyway. That's so, it. Natalie, I think we've exhausted the patience of everybody here. Such thanks for letting us Thank join you. you. And, um, and, uh, and remember that, 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 remember that uh, one good reason, of course, for, for fighting uh, climate change is that um, you know, we're coming up on that season when um, the earth just whimsically decides for a little while to remove friction from the equation and we get to slide across its surface river on the rink at the you know civic center but the rest of us on the trails here at, at whatever uh, on the list of things worth fighting for winter is one of them so have a very good winter everybody go bobcats <laughs>